This is a message from the Ministry of Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. For more information about our church, please visit calvarysb.com. Well, uh, let's, let's read a few verses here. We're going to talk about the transformation of a king. Uh, the title of today's message really is Tree Trimming, uh, the Humbling of a King. And we're going to see how King Nebuchadnezzar goes from a pagan ruler to a praising believer. You know, one thing I've always enjoyed in the movies is a good chase scene. I love the Bourne identities and I love, you know, all 13 of the Fast and Furious movies or whatever, you know. Uh, they always have these great chase scenes in them and the better the chase scene has more vehicles, you know, skateboards, the mopeds, the motorcycles, the boats, the airplanes. And, and I just love seeing that. And what's exciting even, even in a greater way, of course, is how God is in pursuit of us. A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Pursuit of God, describing our pursuit of knowing God. But he also wrote a book called The Pursuit of Man, describing how God, since the beginning of time, has been chasing us down with relentless love. And this morning, we're going to see how God chased down King Nebuchadnezzar, how he pursued him and had a plan for him. And I want us to see that as we read Daniel chapter 4. And, and what I want us to do is actually look at the last kind of couple phrases of the chapter. These are spoken from a man who's been transformed. Daniel chapter 4, let's look at verse 34 and then we'll pray. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in the house today, your house. We're glad to be here. We just ask your Holy Spirit to come and begin to tear walls down, to soften up hearts, to open up ears, to clear our minds so we can receive from you, not my word, but your very word spoken in this place, that it would accomplish this work to make us more and more like you, King Jesus. So would you do that very thing today? We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, over the course of these first four chapters in the book of Daniel, one character has remained the same, and that's King Nebuchadnezzar. You see, in chapter 1, we come in contact with this king who invades and conquers Jerusalem, and he captures with, uh, back, to Cab back to Babylon uh, and the future generation, the young and the bright. And Daniel and his three friends are a part of those captured youth. And Nebuchadnezzar brings them back to Babylon to indoctrinate them, to make them become Babylonians. But we remember from chapter one early on, Daniel and the boys, they purposed in their heart to not defile themselves with the king's food. And so we see the king Nebuchadnezzar immediately confronted with this, this group of men who worship a different God than he does. And come to find out at the end of the trial, the testing, these men were 10 times smarter than everybody else. And Nebuchadnezzar is just struck with the fact, wow, these, these guys are bright. These guys are brilliant. I'm going to set them over my palace. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. It frightens him. It troubles him. And the dream team of his can't interpret it, remember. In steps Daniel, who prays and fasts and seeks the Lord on Nebuchadnezzar's behalf and God reveals the dream to him, and he says it to Nebuchadnezzar. And in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar is confronted with the God who can reveal secrets. In chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar, filled with pride and arrogance, builds a statue to himself, demanding everyone to bow down to it. And if you don't bow, we're going to be thrown into the fiery burning furnace. And we know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refuse to bend the knee. And Nebuchadnezzar, filled with fury, throws him in the furnace. 
only to find that they do not burn up and shrivel, but they find themselves dancing and marching and just having a great time with someone that looks like the Son of God, Jesus right there in the fire. In chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar is confronted with the God of heaven who has the power to save. And here we find ourselves in chapter 4, this progression of Nebuchadnezzar being confronted with God as a revealer of secrets, as someone who's wise, who's someone who is powerful. In chapter 4, it's going to come down to it. And we're going to see the transformation of this man. I, again, I believe, we just read his own statement. He becomes, I believe, a believer in Jehovah God. And I believe we will see him in heaven. And we're going to see this played out in three acts. We're going to see this confrontation we're going to see some humiliation, and we're going to end with restoration. And my three points, they're not equal. I'm going to spend more time on the first one, so don't get scared like, oh, man, he's got two more points to go through. No, we're going to get through them. Don't worry. Don't worry. All right? So the first point, the first idea is a confrontation, a confrontation. Let's look at chapter 4 of verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. And so the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. And Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. So we're going to see this confrontation. Again, Nebuchadnezzar knows a lot about God intellectually, but knows, doesn't know him yet personally confrontation. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like confrontation, right? To confront means to, fa to, to, to face up to an issue, to, to go come face to face with a problem. Uh, I don't like doing that. My palms get sweaty. My stomach hurts. I don't like confronting people. I don't like coming up with a situation and trying to figure it out. I like to just, I'm a peacemaker, you know, I like to just make everybody's happy, you know, and it's hard to confront. Uh, but Daniel, we see here, he understands this dream. And if you just remember a little bit from last week, again, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and he wants someone to interpret it. So he brings in Daniel. That's where we find ourselves now in verse 19. And, and Daniel knows the interpretation. You see, the first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, um, it kind of dignified Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, I dreamt of this, um, this, this statue that had a big old head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar, you're that head. And you're just like, yeah, that's right. That's me. You know, it kind of dignified Nebuchadnezzar. Well, the second dream, it dethrones him, right? He becomes this tree that will be chopped down. It's a harsh truth, a harsh message to deliver. And what I want you to understand is that this confrontation needs to be filled with compassion. And this is what we see, Daniel. Look at again at verse 19. It says, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, he was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. Or therefore astonished. It kind of means this idea of stunned, uh, to be shocked. The idea for trouble means to be alarmed, to be frightened. It, it's, it's almost as though Daniel does not want to deliver the interpretation to the king. It's like, in fact, we even keep reading. It's like the king has to kind of prod him along, right? You see that in verse 19. The king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or interpretation trouble you. Like, like, go ahead and tell me what it is. And then Daniel says, I, I, my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you. And his interpretation concern your enemies. I want you to notice this compassion that Daniel has for Nebuchadnezzar. He does not see him as the enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that blows my mind. Daniel says, I, I, wish this I wish this dream was for your enemy, Nebuchadnezzar, not for you. D does that just kind of make you just take a moment to pause? Nebuchadnezzar was the king who captured Daniel, who stole him away to Babylon who made him a slave, who changed his name, who most would say made him a eunuch, which means he also stole his manhood from this man. And yet Daniel, you see in verse 19, he, he's just astonished, he's troubled. I don't want this dream to be about you, Neb. I care for you. There's this compassionate, this, this, this kind, caring heart that, uh, that Daniel has toward Nebuchadnezzar. It's like his heart is breaking for him. And it just 
right off the bat here, man, the first thing, it just, it just makes me question my own compassion. It makes me think, man, how compassionate, how caring am I? And in fact, I've been praying, Lord, would you, would you enlarge my compassion? I want greater care for others. How, how are you doing? How, how, how much do you care for those around you? Like, now, of course, I know your immediate circle, obviously, like your, your spouse, you care for that person, right? Your, your kids, you care for them. Your dog, yes, I care for my new dog, right? I mean, we, we have, you know, people we care about, but, but I've been praying, Lord, would you, would you widen my circle? <laughs> Would you increase my compassion to those that I meet? And that's what we're talking about with Easter. We're encouraging you, family, to take out those flyers and pass them out to people that you um, would care about, that, that you would have compassion over. And, and maybe you're like, well, man, I don't care about the, the, the checkout person at Trader Joe's. Well, well could you? <laughs> could you care about that person? Could you care about their eternal soul? Time is short and hell is hot, and how about we have some compassion? And this, this first thought, friends, it just stirred me up. It just stirred me up. I think about Jesus. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 9, we read about him just ministering all day long, all day long, all day long. And then toward the end of the day, he still sees the crowds. And he doesn't become desensitized. He doesn't become numb. He doesn't tell them to go away. What does it say? He looked at the crowds, and he was moved with compassion. It means like his bowels were just twisting. He just, he just cried out for them. Oh, they're, they're, like, they're like sheep without a shepherd, he would say. Oh, friends, how, how's your compassion? How, how greatly do you care for those around you? Not just immediately, but even your greater circumference. I pray that God would open our heart. God would break our heart. He'd open our eyes to see people how he sees people. Now Daniel has a decision to make because this interpretation we're going to look at in a moment, it was a harsh truth. I'm going to tell you, it was harsh. And what's he going to do? Is he going to back down? Is he going to, is he going to be able, um, he cares for Nebuchadnezzar, but is he going to speak truth to him? Would he deliver the truth? Now I mentioned, I mentioned the dream team earlier, right? Not Matthew Johnson or Michael Jordan, a different dream team, right? Look, look, look at verse seven. Look up at verse seven. It seems though, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he says, he, the magicians and the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, they came in and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. Verse seven, they did not make known. It's almost like his dream team knew what the dream meant, but they were afraid to tell it to him. Right, they, 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 they just were too scared to do this. You see, confrontation not only takes compassion, but confrontation takes courage, takes courage. We're going to read a chunk of verses here. Let's look at verse 20. Daniel courageously says this to the king. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. Verse 22, it is you. O king who have grown and become strong for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, your dominion to the end of the earth. And in, in as much as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it. But leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of, of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. And this is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. They shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of men, and gives it to him whoever he chooses. And do you see that in verse 22? The courage it took for Daniel, what does he say? It is you, king. You're the tree. 
You're going to get chopped down. They're going to drive you, verse 25. They're going to drive you from men. You're going you're gonna to eat grass like an oxen. You, you, your, your back will be wet with dew. Later on we read, your, your hair will become like the eagle's feathers. Your, your nails are going to grow out like claws. That's going to happen to you, Nebuchadnezzar. It reminds us of, remember when, when um, Nathan confronted David and he said, it is you, you're the man. Same idea here. Now, the reason I mentioned this takes some courage because you've got to remember who's Daniel talking to, right? Daniel was esteemed, that's true, but he was still a slave. And King Nebuchadnezzar is still King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, the guy with like a gesture could throw Daniel in the furnace and I'm sure he's still around somewhere, you know. Uh, with, with, with the frown of his, of his lips, he could have someone impale him with a sword. Remember, the king had absolute power. Whatever he wanted to do, he could do. No one could stop him. And here's a Daniel. This truth, God's given him to deliver this message that was, that was, that was rough, man. You're the tree. You're going to be cut down, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to become like a wild animal, Nebuchadnezzar. What's Daniel going to do? And it took some courage to stand up to the king, my friends. The great theologian, John Wayne, he said this, uh, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. I love that. Courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. Courage is the willingness to act in spite of fear. Compassion and Courage are needed ingredients for confrontation. All right, we, we maybe have all, since this example, close to home, and maybe just speaking to someone face to face, and you happen to notice there's some food in their mouth, you know, food stuck in their teeth, probably like a kale chip, you know, because kale is very sticky and hard to eat. And, and, uh, and you're talking to the person, and they got it stuck in their tooth, you know, and because you care, you have some courage to confront. And say, hey, hey, brother, sister, wait a minute. You got, here's a toothpick. Pick that kale out of your mouth, you know. Uh, uh, I care about you. Uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, you got some issues. Uh, uh, let's, let's take care of it, right? And because, because Daniel cared for Nebuchadnezzar, he had this compassion for him, he took courage and confronted him. And in fact, it gets even deeper. Look at verse 26. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. Love speaks up. And because Daniel loved this man, he cared for this man, he, had, he took courage, and not only does he say, you're the tree, he even says, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, you got to repent. You see that there? Break off your sins. Stop living this way. Show some mercy. Turn toward God, and perhaps he will relent that's what happened in Nineveh, right? The town of Nineveh repented and God relented. And so Daniel, just with this courage and this boldness, just says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the tree. Judgment's coming, so repent. Friends, let me tell you something. Sometimes the right thing to do is to say the hard thing to someone. Proverbs 27, 6 says this. Faithful are the wounds of of a friend. Let me tell you something, friends. You, you need some courage. Sometimes you might need to stand up for holiness. You, you might need to speak out for truth. And it's going to take some courage. And because we love, because we care, that's why we confront. And I just wonder, maybe there's someone in your life that you know right now that, that is just living in sin, that there's something that is, just, that is just off, that they need to break off. And the Holy Spirit's been asking you to take a stand for righteousness and to take some courage 
and in love and compassion confront our brother or sister. Now listen, in, in your margins, write this, Galatians chapter six, verse one. Galatians chapter six, verse one, that gives us, gives us three qualifications for confrontation. I just want to give them to you real quick. Three qualifications for confrontation. Galatians 6, one says this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Three qualifications right here. First, you got to have the right purpose. See that word, restore? Why do we confront? Because we want to restore somebody. We want to bring healing and help. We want to encourage them. We want to build them up, not break them down. The right purpose, the right posture. It's the spirit of what? Gentleness. Gentleness, not harshness, not pointing the finger, not sin sniffing. Right? No, we got to have the right posture when we confront someone with gentleness. We need to have the right precaution, considering yourself, knowing, man, we're, I'm just one step away. By the grace of God go I. And so those are three little, little nugs for you guys, right, to put away. Galatians 6, chapter 1. Love, though, speaks up. Confrontation needs courage and compassion. Our next act is the humiliation of the king. Let's check it out. Look at verse 28. Now all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of 12 months, he was walking around the royal palace of Babylon. And the king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Anybody see, see a problem there? <laughs> I want you to first notice this phrase, verse 29, at the end of the 12 months. 12 months. So Daniel, in confrontation with compassion and courage, he tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream. Nebi, you're the tree. You're going to get cut down. I suggest you repent of your sins. Perhaps God will relent. And 12 months go by. Now, from heaven's perspective, God was patient with him, right? And God was allowing time to go on, giving Nebuchadnezzar time to repent. But from the earthly perspective, from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective, what did he probably think? He, 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 he mistook delayed judgment for divine acceptance of his sin, right? Friends, never mistake the patience of God with you in your sin for the permission of God for you to sin, right? We know Romans 2, 4, it's the goodness, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And so 12 months go by, this, this time God's just waiting. Is Nebuchadnezzar gonna kneel? Is he gonna repent? And a year goes by and what happens? Time doesn't allow repentance. Time just makes his heart grow harder and for pride to swell up greater. And we learn a few things from pride here, the ABCs of pride right here. Check this out. A, it's all about you. You see that in verse 30? Is not this the great Babylon that I have built by my mighty power for my majesty? Me, 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 right? Pride is all about you. In fact, what's the middle letter in the, and as you spell out the word pride? It's the letter I, <laughs> right? It's all about you. It's all about I, me, 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 I'm the me monster, right? And Nebuchadnezzar up on his palace, he looks down and he says, wow, look what I did. And let me tell you something. It was magnificent. Babylon was the greatest city of the known world. It was 14 miles square. It had a double wall security kind of thing going around. It had a moat around it. The walls were said to be so thick that chariots could race on the top of them. There's 52 temples built there to the different gods. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, he married a woman from the mountain region. And she was lonely. She was in the desert. She wanted a mountain. So he basically creates a mountain for her. He builds this mountain. They call it the Hanging Gardens, one of the seven ancient wonders of, uh, wonders of the ancient world. With his own irrigation. I mean, it was just fabulous. Gold everywhere. It was a great city. 
But mistakenly, Nebuchadnezzar thought that he had done that, right? He didn't realize, he didn't acknowledge God in all of his achievements. There's nothing wrong about him being a great builder, a great general, a great leader, but that he never acknowledged God in the process. And he was just puffed up. Look at what I have done. The lesson that he needed to learn, which is repeated three times in this section, is he needed to learn that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and that he gives it to whomever he pleases. It's all about you. Pride is also a barrier to blessing. We get this from James chapter four, verse six. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know that verse. It scares me. God resists the proud. You know what resist means? It's like, like a resistance band. Like it, it goes against. It's a barrier. Now, I, mean, I don't know about you. I got a hard enough time just living life, just living life. I don't want God resisting me. I, I don't want a barrier. I don't want him to go against what, I'm, what I've got going on. He resists the proud. Pride is a barrier to blessing. Right? And pride calcifies your heart. We understand calcification here in Santa Barbara, right? We all have hard water in our sinks, right? We all notice the, the, the water leaves that residue on our faucets or on our sinks or if one of those glass shower doors, right? It just leaves it all filthy all the time. I got one of those shower heads that has silicone jets. So when the calcium builds up, you can just kind of flick it off. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like a genius idea. And what happens over time is pride calcifies our heart. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, put that in your margin. Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses talks to the nation of Israel. They're about to go to the promised land. And he tells them, listen, guys, you're about to go over the promised land. And listen, don't forget God. Don't forget him. Don't let your heart grow hard. Remember who led you. Remember who fed you. Remember who protected you. And when you go over there and you build your big houses and you have your big pastures, don't let your heart forget who brought you there. He was warning them against pride. It's a great little section, Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 through 18. Pride calcifies the heart. And sometimes in order to break us down, God's going to have to give us a little flick, you know. And that's what we see with Nebuchadnezzar. Pride was all about him as a barrier to blessing. It calcified his heart. And so what does God have to do? He's going to have to break him down. That's what we read in Proverbs 29, verse 23. A man's pride will bring him low. This humiliation, it came suddenly. Verse 31, now while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. It came suddenly. Friend, let me tell you, God has every right to just break into your life and, get, and speak to you. Nebuchadnezzar, a year goes by, he, he doesn't know what's up. He just kind of mouths off this and God just enters into his life. Today's the day, Neb. Today's the day. Your kingdom will be stripped from you. It came suddenly and it was severe. Look at verse 32. And they shall drive you from men. And your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen and seven times, seven years will pass over you until you know, again, here's the lesson, until you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to him whoever he chooses. And that very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird, bird's claws. Pride. It turned an angel into the devil. It turns the king into a beast. Now, friends, he doesn't become an actual animal. Right? There's, there's no Wolverine situation here, right? No werewolf. It's, it's, he, he behaves like an animal. 
There's an actual medical term called um, lycanthropy. Lyco is the Greek word for wolf, anthropy for meaning man. Lycanthropy is when a man, a person, acts like a wolf. Or boanthropy is when a person acts like an ox or a cow. And there's actually, you can kind of Google this, there's different cases of, of people kind of going insane and thinking that they're animals and, and eating grass and just doing this very thing. Now, now, I don't know what happened exactly, but we do know that God ordained this to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. And it really did happen. It wasn't, it's not some fairy tale. It's not an animation movie, right? This is, this is real. And this really happened to this king. He, he was driven from men. And if you look at different scholars would say in the annual, annuals of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's time, there's like a seven-year gap where nothing is written about him, you know. And, and, and he's just driven from men. He, he just loses his mind. And, and he just goes. And some would say uh, that maybe he remained in the palace uh, some would say maybe even Daniel kind of was his carekeeper a little bit. Uh, in chapter 5, Daniel will mention this incident, and he'll talk about how Nebuchadnezzar uh, lived with the wild donkeys, and they fed him grass. Kind of seems like he was kind of kept in this little area, perhaps. Uh, but he was just humbled. He was humbled. And what I want you to understand is, although this is horrific, I can't even imagine this happening. Do you know that the worst the worst thing, there's a worser thing that God could do. And that would be to leave him in his pride. That'd be the worst thing. It's to leave Nebuchadnezzar right where he was. And you see, that, that's not what the case. You see, if, if it wasn't for the pigsty, the prodigal never would have returned home. If it wasn't for being swallowed by a great fish for three days, Jonah never would have went to Nineveh. And so too for you, for me. Sometimes God creates a humbling experience so that there will be a transformation in our life. And without the low, we can never handle the high. And so in love, God allows this to happen to Nebuchadnezzar because what is his goal is restoration always, right? Let's look at this restoration, the final act in our story. Verse 34. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised, and I honored him who lives forever. <laughs> For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Notice verse 34. What does it say there? And at the end of the time, remember, this entire event was not for Nebuchadnezzar's destruction before his restoration. Right? This, there was a purpose for the punishment. At the end of the time, God always has a goal in mind. He's not just arbitrarily doing things, right? God has a purpose always. Remember the dream. The tree was cut down but not uprooted. The stump was left. And the stump, remember, had a band of iron and a band of bronze around it, meaning that it was not going to split in two. It was going to remain intact. And Nebuchadnezzar was going to be restored to his kingdom. Won't it be divided? No one would try to usurp his authority. He was going to come in. And in fact, we read that in verse 36, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar says that majesty was even added to him. At the end of the time, friends, there, there, was, there was an end game here. There was a result restoration was the purpose. And what are the two steps that cured the prideful heart of Nebuchadnezzar? Number one, he looked up. He looked up. Do you see that there, friends? Again, in verse 34, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted my eyes to heaven. Friends, this, this is a beautiful thing. Do you remember what he did previously in verse 30? He's on top of his palace. And what's he doing? Looking down. Look what I built. Look at that moat. Look at that wall. Look at that temple. And he was looking down. Friends, pride always looks down. It always looks down. It always looks around and compares itself with each other. I have a wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people 
And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Friends, it's not until Nebuchadnezzar lifts up his eyes and looks up to the heavens and boom, his reason is restored. His understanding comes back to him. Because it was at that moment that he was truly humbled. And he realized it's not my kingdom that lasts forever. I'm not the king of kings. My dominion will not go from generation to generation. No, 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 no. The king of heaven. Huh. The most high God. His dominion is everlasting. And he finally learned the lesson. He looked up. Oh, friends, that needs to be true of you and I. We need to look up to the heavens. We're just mere men and women. We, don't need to get, we get caught, so caught up in our own affairs, our own life. We have to say, no, Lord, I'm lifting my eyes to you. It's a cure for pride, looking up. Second, he shouted out. He shouted out. I love it. Look at verse 36. And at the same time, my reason returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My honor, my splendor returned to me. <clears throat> my counselors and nobles restored, resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom. An excellent majesty was added to me. Verse 37. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All of whose works are truth, his ways, justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. I want you to know this word in verse 37, the word extol. I love that word, man. Extol. X means out. Toll means to raise. <clears throat> you see, he was shouting out praise to God. That was a cure for pride. Do you remember what he demanded in chapter 3? With such just raising and shouting of sound, the lyre and the cymbal and the drum, when you hear that sound, bow down to the statue that I made. But now here he's a transformed man, my friends. And now he's extolling, he's enthusiastically praising the God of heaven. Friends, he was shouting out praises to his king. And friends, this is why I believe we will see him in heaven. He lifted up his eyes in humility saying, God, you're king. And he shouted out praise, Lord, you are greater than me. Your dominion is from everlasting to everlasting. You see, worship turns our heart from ourselves and it puts it on God. That's why we love to worship in this place. That's why I love to have it loud in here. I love it, man. I, wanna just, I just want to extol the Lord. You know why? Because, man, it's a cure for pride. And when I'm worshiping Jesus, I get my eyes off my stinking self and I put it on Jesus. Worship's not about you. It's about him. And that's the cure for pride, my friends, looking up, shouting out. Friends, exciting, exciting stuff. Love scripture. I love thinking about this account we have. It reminds us of, it tells us of the story of this man, King Nebuchadnezzar, but also speaks to us as well. Again, maybe you're here this morning and wondering if God knows you or cares about you. We began with this idea, God is chasing after you. He's in pursuit of you. He has a relentless love that is just ready to just grab a hold of you. And even for those of you that are sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ, God's still pursuing you. He loves you so much. Maybe you're here this morning and, you know, just in my own heart, I just think about compassion. I want greater compassion. Maybe that's something the Lord's stirring upon your heart. Maybe there's someone here that God is stirring you. You need to speak up. Love speaks up. And there's someone in your, your family or your vicinity, your sphere of influence that's in sin. And with compassion, the Spirit's asking you, would you take a stand for holiness? And would you in love confront this brother and sister and tell them, hey, hey man, what you're doing is wrong. I'm saying this because I care for you and I, want, I, I don't want you to receive the judgment of God. I want you to receive forgiveness and would you, let's walk this way together. I believe the Lord's spoken to you guys here this morning. So excited. This is the first Sunday of the month, so we get to remember communion together today. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and we're going to have a chance to just remember the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross for us. That although did he not have the right to be filled with pride, he was the Son of God. And yet in humility, he clothed himself with our shame and our sin and went to the cross for us. 
He didn't fight for his rights. He didn't even really confront the Pharisees and Sadducees in a sense. He just, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter, to the cross. Oh, friends, what an example we have in Jesus. Uh, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we just ask that you would seal the work that you've done in our lives today. And Lord, I needed to hear this. I, I would rather humble myself in the sight of the Lord than for you to humble me. Lord, I think that's all of our prayer, Lord. Would you humble, would, would we bend our knee to you? Would we be a people, a church, a family that lifts up our eyes to you and shouts out praise unto your name? Father, bless this time this morning as we remember you through communion and through worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a message from the ministry of Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. For more information about our church, please visit calvarysb.com.